In this lecture, we're going to cover some of the basics of experimentation. There are three things you have to keep in mind when you're looking at the design of an experiment. The first thing you have to keep in mind is how many independent variables is a study using. So it might have something like gender, male and female, and you're looking at some outcome like empathy. Um, but it might have a second variable that it's also interested in. For instance, um, level of anger, high and low. In that case, gender and level of anger are two independent variables that you're interested in seeing how they function uh, and are linked to some kind of outcome such as empathy. You could have more independent variables. You have to always have at least one. Also, the number of treatment conditions for each independent variable. With gender, you have male and female. There's two levels of that independent variable. With anger, maybe you break it up further into low, medium, and high. And in that case, you have three levels to that independent variable. So you have to keep in mind how many levels there are, how many conditions there are to each independent variable. And also, whether the same or different participants are used in each of the treatment conditions. So in a between subjects experiment, people are exposed to only one condition. So you come in, you are exposed to either uh, violent television or you're in a different group that watches television that is a comedy or a drama but not violent. You're in only one group and you're not exposed to all levels of the independent variable. That's a between subjects design. A within subjects design, people are exposed to all levels of the independent variable. Um, so in that case, if you think that um, some kind of technique or some kind of skill enhances, uh, you know, studying more than some other kind of technique, maybe you have people participate in learning three different kinds of techniques and you see which one produces the highest scores on a test. In that case, it's a within subjects design. They participate in each level of the independent variable and they're exposed to all different levels of the independent variable. The one thing to keep in mind is that all true experiments are characterized by random assignment. If you don't have random assignment, you don't have a true experiment. So the simplest experiment, it has an experimental group and it has a control group. The experimental group gets the something special and the control group is treated just the same but uh, not getting the technique or the intervention or the actual drug or whatever it is you think is making some particular kind of difference. Uh, so just visually, this is what the design looks like. So you have participants come in, you randomly assign them into the experimental group or the control group conditions. Uh, the random assignment is generally done based on probability. So flipping a coin, pulling a number out of a hat, and the experimental group gets whatever it is you think is going to make some you know, difference on an outcome and the control group is treated just the same. The experimental group gets the real drug, the control group gets a placebo, and then you look at the outcome on some de dependent variable, uh, you know, does a particular drug versus placebo actually reduce depression. Sometimes, however, you might want to have a design that's a little more complex, um, particularly if you're doing some kind of intervention. So if you're thinking of doing a study that you want to see are there effects of whatever educational technique or skill technique that you want to teach someone, uh, you know, does that have some kind of bearing on outcomes, you will want to use a pretest, post-test, randomized control group design. One of the things when students are sometimes coming up with an idea for an intervention, one of the things they forget about is the control group aspect. They think, well, I'm going to have a group and I'm going to do some kind of educational intervention and I'm going to see if it makes them do better. But sometimes, just by being exposed to the pretest, just by talking about something or learning a little bit through the test maybe about a particular subject, people could theoretically perform better on the post-test and not have necessarily anything to do with your educational intervention. So the most solid design is to take an experimental group that gets a pretest and a control group that gets a pretest. So say 
attitudes towards autism. And then the experimental group gets an actual lecture uh, and some materials about autism uh, covering points that you think are important. And the control group basically just sits around and is told to hang out, read, do things on their phone uh, for the same duration of time. And then the experimental group would get a post-test, the control group would get a post-test, and you would see how much of their attitudes towards autism change based on the experimental uh, intervention. If the experimental group's post-test is you know, better than the control group's post-test, and you've randomly assigned participants into either the experimental or control group, you can have some faith that perhaps the you know, difference on outcomes has something to do with your experimental treatment. Um, however, there are more complex designs, uh, such as the Solomon randomized four group design, that allow you to sort of have the best of both worlds. In truth, uh, while this is the most solid design, it's probably the one done least often uh, because it is a little bit complicated and you have to run a lot of different um, trials and you need participants. So, you know, the, the more trials uh, or conditions that you have, the more participants that you're going to need to actually be in those conditions. But you can see, uh, you know, there's random assignment of participants, and they're going into either experimental groups or control groups. Um, the difference here, and the increasing level of sophistication, is that you give the experimental and control group uh, in one condition pretest, but you skip the pretest. Uh, with the other experimental and control group. And this allows you to sort of compare is the pretest doing anything in terms of increasing their uh, knowledge or in terms of increasing scores that is not actually due to your experimental manipulation. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of look at the post tests, you can compare control groups, you can compare, compare experimental groups, and you can also factor in to what effect did the pretest sensitize people to the particular topic and change outcomes. So this is sort of the Cadillac of designs, but again, you need participants and uh, you need to have time because you have to run a few trials. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try uh, participating in an experiment and seeing how we do. So I have here the um, web address to participate in the Stroop test. So the Stroop test basically, and you can kind of just uh, copy it and sort of paste it into your browser. The Stroop test basically has a congruent and an incongruent condition. It's going to ask you to uh, hit the um, correct color of what you are seeing and not what the word says. So a congruent condition is blue, is colored blue, and you would press B for blue to indicate that the, um, the color that you're seeing is blue. However, red is an incongruent condition actually colored green but you're supposed to hit green and not what the word says so let's take a moment go to the browser and kind of try that out so here's the Stroop test and uh, basically you just press start and you can see that it's asking you to click the button that matches the color of this word in this case we're going to click uh, green and it's correct and then this is red and then this is black and then this is black so on and so on so it's your goal that you're going to hit the color that you see as fast as you can and as quickly as you can and in the end you'll get a final score take a look at the final score and see how you are doing in terms of congruent and uh, incongruent conditions were you faster on one or slower on the other So basically, what you're going to do as part of uh, the discussion post and homework is you're going to create your own experiment and you're going to post it in Blackboard uh, for discussion. And what you're going to do is think about how would you change the Stroop. So they've used the Stroop in other ways. They've taken the Stroop and they've made an emotional Stroop out of it where instead of um, using colors, they use words. So in some cases, they've taken people who are recovering from substance abuse and they use regular words and then words that are related to substance abuse. So 
alcohol, bar, stuff like that. And they mix it in with regular words. And they find people who are having a difficult time with recovery tend to, uh, you know, sort of have more difficulty identifying those words and take longer on them. Uh, you can change it. You can do shapes. You can do um, pictures. You can do anything where you kind of have congruent and incongruent conditions. And think about how would you take the information about this experiment and create a new experiment and test a variation on the Stroop effect. Be sure to identify the experimental control conditions and also if you have levels uh, if the, of the independent variable, if it's within subject. And you're going to post that in the discussion section and we'll take a look at what everybody comes up with for their own experiments. So confounding is an issue in experiments. And confounding is basically where uh, you have issues where both the participant and the experimenter have expectations regarding the experiment. So demand characteristics is anything that might clue the participant in as to what is being expected of them. The placebo effect is one thing we know influences outcomes, right? A placebo effect is where the person, although they haven't actually received a treatment, actually starts feeling better or doing better. The power of the mind in thinking that they're actually receiving some kind of um, treatment actually makes the participant get better. So one solution is to single blind the experiment, to not let the participant know what condition they're in. But the other end of the problem is the experimenter. And the experimenter also can come at the uh, you know study or the experiment with bias, that they sort of, you know, want things to come out a certain way. They're invested in things coming out a certain way, even if they don't do it consciously. So the solution is to double blind, that the best kind of experimental paradigm is one where neither the experimenter nor the participant knows what condition they're in. And this creates a situation where both are blind to the condition. And it eliminates some of these biases. There are other threats to internal validity uh, that you have to sort of worry about, things that can throw your experiment off. Um, and one is history. History is basically that you run a particular study and um, you are maybe doing something on women and, you know, uh, codependency. And what happens is maybe the participants go out between the pretest and post-test and they're like, well, maybe I need to learn about this codependency. You know, maybe that's me. And they start looking up things on Google and start getting self-help books. Um, things that are part of the environment that influence the participants between pretest and post-test can also threaten the validity of the experiment. Maturation is another thing that can uh, wreak havoc between pretest and post-test. And maturation is simply that participants can get better at something even if it's not you and your experimental manipulation that allows them to get better. So um, in that case, you know, playing a video game, once you play the video game, you are going to maybe be better at that video game. Uh, you know, despite any kind of, you know, help or interventions on the part of the experimenter, you just get better at it from having been exposed to it. Statistical regression towards the mean is simply that that which goes up must come down and that which is down sometimes comes up. You can think of it as the Yankees have won 27 World Series championships. They're a very good team, but they're not always the best team. It's hard to always be on the fringe and uh, sort of the outer ends of the distribution. Sometimes they're not the best team. This is, if you remember the 2003 World Series, who were the Marlins? The Marlins won that year. A not so great team who was underperforming came up a little bit towards the mean and a really good team such as the Yankees came down and didn't do so well. Regressing towards the mean. And mortality, maybe not as fatal as it sounds, uh, but mortality is simply when participants leave your study. Um, and if you have a longitudinal study and a lot of people leave the study for whatever reasons over time, it can compromise results. If you start with 500 and then you're only down to 200 over time, this can be a problem for interpreting what everything means. And homework. So homework for this week is going to be from Understanding Research, Topics 37 to 42, 
and then also to be sure to place your responses uh, in the discussion regarding these troop experiment.